coming back. In the previous episode on the vacuum tube computer, I kind of left on a little bit of a cliffhanger saying that there was something really cool that I wanted to show you, but I just didn't have enough time to get to it in that episode. And that's what I want to do today. I want to show you guys what that is. But first things first, it's only been about two days since the previous episode went live and the feedback on it has been staggering. You guys are awesome. It's already up to nearly 300 comments, which is by far and away the most amount of interaction I've gotten on a video ever in such a short time. Uh, there was just a ton of fantastic suggestions for both uh, the name of the machine as well as different ways to build it. I mean, this is just one page of names and there are many, many more than this. I've only been able to make it through about a third of the comments. <laughs> it's The feedback is just amazing. Thank you guys so much. There's a lot of really brilliant ideas in there and it's gonna take me a little while to go through, collate them, kind of start wrapping my head around all of the different ways that you guys are suggesting to tackle this problem. And then hopefully we can come up with a solution that is going to work. Uh, and it's not gonna have been possible without the help from you guys. So thank you so much. Uh, but what are we doing today? Well, I could sit here and try to explain it to you, but I think it's a lot better if I just show it to you. So let's hop over to the bench and let me show you what somebody has made because it is awesome. All right, what I wanna show you today is actually entirely on the computer itself. Well, not the vacuum tube computer itself on a modern normal computer itself. So first we gotta build it. Let's just go ahead and build it. We do GCC dash O and then UE14500 dash EMU. And that sounds like something pretty special, huh? All right, well, let's, let's tell it what file we're gonna build it from. 14500 dash EMU dot C. Um, so whatever it was, it was built in the C programming language. And then we'll do slash LPD curses. Uh, okay, let's just hit enter. Let it do its thing here. All right, we're back at the prompt here. Let's just run it. Let's do dot slash UE14500 dash EMU. Hit enter. <laughs> That's cool every time it pops up. That's so exciting. That's right. This is an emulator for the UE14500 vacuum tube computer. That is awesome. Very exciting. We have the computer essentially represented in ASCII form on the far left. You can say it says start at the top. That's the soft start. And each little period represents a vacuum tube. And then you can see where it says inst, I-N-S-T. We have four V's in a row. That represents the four vacuum fluorescent displays that we're using to show what value is stored in the instruction register on the actual machine. Uh, and then you can see it says remote. And again, we have a bunch of VFDs. These are the two rows of VFDs on the remote control. And then we have five zeros or ones that we can flip between. These are the five toggle switches. And then we have the clock, which is the push button. So the actual hardware is represented fully here in the emulator. Now, it may look a little strange being entirely in ASCII, but uh, the brilliant man who uh, developed this, Rin, has a very specific reason for having built it this specific way. Now, Rin has been programming in C for years, but he hasn't used the Curses library, and he was looking for a project to potentially play around with the Curses library and get used to it. As I understand it, the Curses library has been around for a very long time, and it's actually really good at emulating old data terminals, uh, meaning that this emulator written as it is here can fit within the 80 column display of any old data terminal. Like for example, an ADDS or ADS a data terminal, much like the one that's sitting on top of the Centurion right now. And that brings us to why Rin wrote it exactly like this, because Rin had this idea of potentially writing an emulator that the Centurion could run. So the Centurion could emulate the vacuum tube computer, and that is just the coolest idea 
ever. I had not thought about that at all. And when Rin mentioned it to me, it blew my mind. It was such a cool idea. And now that's like a long-term goal of mine to figure out enough about the Centurion as well as working closely with Ren to try and port his uh, C written emulator over to it and hopefully someday get the Centurion emulating the vacuum tube computer. Now when Rin was developing this, he was actually going through and scrubbing through old videos on the channel to try and glean as much information about the build as possible. Now because it's heavily based on the MC14500, he was able to get a ton of information from Motorola's handbook on the chip, but the ALU is totally different. So there were some question marks that he had lingering in the ALU itself that I unfortunately didn't cover very well in my videos, but he got it mostly working and then got in touch with me, sent me an early version of it and asked me if I wouldn't mind comparing it against the real hardware. And of course, I, that's absolutely something I would love to do. So I pulled out the real hardware and I started comparing it and we found a few bugs here and there. And right now, I think this thing is a perfect representation of the actual hardware. And speaking of that, I think that's gonna be the best way to demonstrate the emulator. Let's pull the real vacuum tube computer out, set it on the table here, put the laptop next to it, and pit them against each other. <laughs> this is gonna this is gonna be cool. <laughs> All right, I've got the lights off in the room to hopefully make it a little easier to see the VFDs. Now I know that with the camera as far away as it is, they're probably not going to show up all that well, but I in person can see them pretty clearly. Now, every time I power this thing up, it's safest to assume that it always powers up into a chaotic state. Now, in practice, that's not always true. I've noticed some patterns. But essentially what's happening is that the flip-flops, for example, the six tubes here, the tubes are going to warm up at a different rate, which means that for the first 15 or so seconds, this flip-flop is in a pure state of chaos. And that goes for every flip-flop on here, notably the instruction register flip-flop. So it may power up with any one of 16 different instructions stored in it. Now, as I said, in practice, it seems to always fall into the instruction that's currently in there, which is 1000. And also, it seems to always power up with the carry register storing a 1 and the result register storing a 0. Now, Rin with the emulator actually built in the ability to put the chaotic state into it. So that's what this status press a key to initialize instruction zero is. That's talking about setting the initial values that are stored in the individual flip-flops. So I can see by looking at the board here that our instruction is one zero 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 right now. So let's go ahead and punch that in. Next up, it shows the IEN, the input enable register. I can see it's currently storing a zero as well. And then we get to the carry register. It's storing a one. The result register is storing a zero. Then we get down to OEN. I can see that it is off and skip is on. And so that's the emulator currently in the exact same state as the real hardware. That's uh, pretty cool. But let's go ahead and initialize the hardware. We'll try to get an instruction of 000 into the instruction register. So I've got the four switches down here. If I push the clock, uh, I saw all ones, uh, but yeah, there we go. So I had to hit it twice to get a proper 0000 into the instruction register. Now it may seem weird that I was expecting it to be all ones, despite the fact that my instruction was 000, but it powered on with the skip register on. And so I was expecting the skip register to force the instruction to 1111. Now if I, on the emulator here, hit the clock once, we can see that the instruction register goes to all ones, like I was expecting. And then if I hit it again, it goes to all zeros, which is the exact same state that we're in here. All right, now let's do a proper initialization. So we need to do input enable, 
So we'll do a one zero one zero operation. We'll set our data to one and then we'll hit the clock. And then I can see that we have a 1010 in our instruction register and we now have a one in the input enable register. Next, we'll do the output enable register. So that's 1011 with our data at one. And yep, our output enable register is on. And then we will do an operation of 0100. This is one, that's the name of the operation. And it forces a one into the result register and a zero into the carry register. And yep, I can see that those switched. Then we'll do a load of zero into the result register. And there we go, the result register is off. And now the processor is fully initialized, ready for some operations. Let's get the emulator into the same state. So we'll start with a 1010 operation. We'll set our data to one. We'll hit the clock. And yeah, on the emulator, I can see that our input enable register VFD is on. We'll do 1011 for output enable register. Yep, that one kicked on two. Uh, then we'll go to 0100 and we'll hit the clock on that. And yeah, I can see that the symbol for the carry VFD turned off and the result register VFD turned on. And then finally, we will do a load of zero into the result register. And there we go. Again, they're both in the exact same state now. That is awesome. So let's do an actual mathematic operation here. And that should prove that they're both working at pretty much the same level. So we'll start by loading in a one into the result register. So that's 0001 with the data set to one. So we'll load that in and yep, the result register has turned on and then we will add that with a one. So we'll do 0010, we'll leave our data at one. And if we hit add, there we go. We can see that the carry register turned on and the result register turned off. Now let's subtract one from that. So if we do uh, 0011 and we leave our data at one and I hit the clock, we should see the carry turn off and the result register turn on. And yeah, there it goes. So now we've got our one back into the result register and let's go ahead and output that onto the data bus. So that's gonna be a one zero 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 operation. So that's a store operation. If I hit the clock, we should see the data light come on and it did. And as long as I'm holding the clock, the right VFD is on and that is correct. When I release the clock, the right VFD goes off. So that's awesome, that's working perfectly. So let's do the exact same operation on the emulator. So we'll start with a load and we'll set our data to one. So we'll hit the clock and yep, the result register is now storing a one. And then we will do an add with one and hit the clock. And yeah, there we go. The result register turned off. The carry register light turned on. So that's doing good so far. Next, we'll do a subtract one. So 0011 with the data at one. We'll hit the clock again. And yep, the uh, bit moved back into the result register now. And then let's just uh, output that. So we'll do 1000 and then hit the clock and while the clock is on, we can see that the right VFD has kicked on. And as soon as the clock goes off, the right VFD kicks off. So there we go. The emulator is working exactly the same as the hardware. How awesome is that? But the emulator actually has one more trick up its sleeve. So let's go ahead and build the next thing. We'll type GCC, we'll do a dash O, and then UE14500 dash ASM. And I think that might uh, give away the game a little bit here, but we'll do UE14500 dash ASM dot C. Then we'll go ahead and hit enter. And well, now we have an assembler built. And so what can we do with the assembler? Well, let's run it using a file that he has already made for us called hello.s. So we'll do dot slash UE14500 dash ASM. This is going to run the assembler executable. And then we want to feed it the file hello.s. And then we want the output to be hello.emu. So we'll hit enter. And then we'll do dot slash UE14500 dash EMU. This is going to run the emulator executable and we want to feed it the file hello.emu and we want it to put the output in out.txt. 
So let's hit enter and see what happens. And <laughs> well, we see that it opened up the uh, emulator and it did some crazy stuff. And then it got to a spot where it said breakpoint B to resume. So it did the initialization all on its own automatically. And then it hit a kind of pause here. And so if we hit B, it should run the rest of the program. And <laughs> yeah, there it goes. Well, we can see that it's doing uh, essentially STO and STOC commands. And well, <laughs> well, our, our program finished here and uh, we're just back to the prompt here. So let's open up out.txt and see what it says. So C-A-T, out.txt, hit enter. Hello world, that's right. We got the emulator to run and print hello world out on the screen. So the assembler is actually taking a separate, uh, essentially assembly file and turning it into raw machine code that the computer can then read. Well, by computer, I mean the emulator and ultimately the uh, vacuum tube computer itself could theoretically read that. So let's assemble and view the uh, actual hexadecimal for the program that we just ran. So we'll run the assembler again by doing dot slash UE1450 dash ASM. And we want to give it the argument of out FMT and then raw and then hello dot S and we want the output to be hello dot raw. So we'll run that. That finished almost immediately. So we'll, then we'll do hex dump dash C and then hello dot raw. And if we hit that, there we go. That is the actual binary that the machine was executing. That's awesome. We're, we're getting to a point where the vacuum tube computer is starting to feel like a computer. Uh, and well, the emulator here has kind of let us glimpse into the future of what can be. This is really exciting. And so if you want to play with this emulator, it is freely available for you to download and check. I'm actually building up a uh, wiki style site on GitHub for the vacuum tube computer. I put a link in the description below, but here is where all of the in-depth information will be available in a clear and easy to read manner. And this emulator with instructions on how to install it and run it on your computer is also going to be up there. So anybody out there can play with an emulated version of the vacuum tube computer. And I'm gonna work closely with Rin moving forward so that as the vacuum tube computer starts to become closer to being finalized, we can tweak the emulator to more closely represent what the computer itself is turning into. So that's, this is, it's so exciting and it's a ton of fun to play around with. And well, I hope you guys download it and check it out as well because Rin's work here is unbelievably good. Uh, so I wanna thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.